Hey, it's Lemon. Welcome to the Backlogs. Hope you're doing well. Today marks the very last XCOM Enemy Within Challenge run I will ever do. For real this time. But before I get into the thick of it, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to the XCOM community for taking me in. Your kindness is much appreciated, and I can't wait to dig my teeth into XCOM 2. And as my way of saying thank you, be sure to stick around at the end of the video for a quick behind the scenes that'll show you how I mess with XCOM's code to do all sorts of things like speed the game up, add new classes, or whatever you want to do. Just because I'm done challenge running this game doesn't mean the community is, and I can't wait to see what you all come up with. Now then, time for the hardest run I've ever done in XCOM. Now, I know what you're thinking. Lemon, how on earth is a run where you have psionic powers difficult? Well, stick around and find out. The number of brick walls I encountered in this run is actually the reason I started XCOM 2. For those of you wondering, I did a little fiddling behind the scenes to make it so that all of my soldiers start with psionic abilities from the word go. However, they don't start with all of the abilities. Much like the vanilla way of obtaining psionic powers, you have to use them in order to unlock new ones. So right now, all of my soldiers only have Mind Fray, a power that causes 5 damage and reduces a target's aim, will, and mobility. Which sounds overpowered. And to be fair, in the early game, it absolutely is. But, as someone who has had to restart this run five freaking times, let me assure you, Mind Fray is a small comfort in what becomes a horrifying run. But we're not here to dwell on the bad times, I'm here to tell you the best way to accomplish such a run, if it can indeed be done. And the first thing I learned is this, only two classes are good for this run, the Assault and the Support. Both classes have abilities that really impact the way we play, and trust me when I say there is probably no other combination of abilities that makes this run possible, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The first few missions are a cakewalk. Not only do psionic abilities have a massive range, but they don't rely on aim at all. Instead, it's your soldier's will against the enemies. The larger the discrepancy, the higher your chance to hit. This will become incredibly important later, so I'm going to say it again. The larger the discrepancy, the higher your chance to hit. Did a few of you just recoil in horror? Good, good, you're ahead of the curve. I make it through the first mission relatively unscathed, and unlock the second psionic ability for one of my soldiers. We have the choice between Psy Inspiration, an ability that removes mental debuffs and strengthens everyone's will by 30 points for 3 turns, or Psy Panic, which makes enemy units panic and do silly things like run out of cover or potentially shoot their own allies. Spoiler, we will never choose Psy Panic, because cover may as well not exist for my mutant squadron, and the plus 30 boost to will is insanely important. Because for those of you who've already forgotten, the larger the discrepancy, the higher your chance to hit. I research meld as quickly as possible, unlocking the genetics lab in the process, and obtaining the adaptive bone marrow gene mod, which will let my soldiers heal two health every turn and keep their injury times nice and low. I then go about getting satellites set up in Europe, because we've already got the Asia bonus of reducing costs to the officer training school, and I want similar cost reductions for my research. After that, I go about my day doing every mission that comes across my desk, making an extra effort to use as many psionic abilities throughout each mission as possible. The nice thing about Psy Inspiration is that it nearly guarantees that Mindfray will have a 100% hit rate at this point in the game. Combined with the guaranteed 5 damage, it's a hefty hitter. The only thing that sucks about all these superpowers I have is that they're all on cooldowns. Which means if I don't space them out properly, there may be several turns where I don't have the ability to fight back leaving my soldiers open to enemy fire and injury. But despite the added difficulty, I actually enjoyed this new playstyle. It turns XCOM into a completely different game, where picking the wrong ability at the wrong moment will guarantee a bad time. Okay, maybe enjoyed was too strong a word, but by forcing my two soldiers to stretch their brains extremely hard in every mission, I get my support unit all the way to Psy Operative by mission 3, which means I now have access to the all-important ability, Mind Control. And yeah, we could go with Telekinetic Field, which would create a massive force field that protects my units with 40 extra defense, but I'm going to give you some more spoilers. We will never choose Telekinetic Field. You'll see why later. I get a few medals that help out my squad, one which just increases their defense, and another which actually boosts their will depending on how many different nationalities are in the squad, then shoot down my first UFO. Easy enough. And with one of my soldiers already having unlocked mind control, I figured it was about time we even out the squad and started bringing all four units into battle. And I know, it sounds paranoid that I've waited this long to get all my units onto the field, but may I remind you that I've lost this run FIVE TIMES before this run, so trust me when I say it's absolutely vital that you obtain mind control as quickly as possible. With that said, mind control is a finicky thing. 
Much like Mind Fray, its success depends on the difference between your willpower and the enemies. And wouldn't you know it, if your unit is injured, your will is actually less. Now granted, this is true for the enemy as well. An injured enemy is a more easily controlled enemy. But at that point, you're attempting to capture damaged goods, which is sometimes not worth the effort. But despite a few injuries, my squad is starting to look pretty well rounded. I've got two assault classes thus far, both of whom are doing their best to level up their psionic powers and their assault abilities at the same time, my support class is doing whatever supports do, and it's probably only a matter of time before I find another support or another assault to round up the squadron. Not only that, but with one of my soldiers finally reaching the rank of sergeant, we can now purchase the Iron Will ability from the Officer Training School. This ability gives my soldiers a larger will bonus every time they get promoted, which means they'll be as mentally strong as possible by the end game. And yes, this is also why we took only two units into battle for the first couple fights. If the squad was all sergeants by the time we got this ability, we'd have missed out on several levels worth of will boosts. And we need every bit of will we can get. With the squadron looking good and the problem of low willpower seemingly solved, it's time we focused on other problems, like making sure my soldiers don't get killed by a random sectoid. I start researching carapace armor, blow up a few more aliens with my mind, then finally find my last soldier. Another assault class. Eh, good enough. And after an uneventful few days, carapace armor is complete. Time for these nerds to get swole. I also start researching experimental warfare so that I can get tactical rigging sooner rather than later, then buy four nanofiber vests, because more HP is always a plus, and it's not like they're using their grenades. I don't exactly have the money for four sets of carapace armor at the moment, but we'll get there eventually. I also finally got to see what mind control does, and let me tell you, it's pretty neat. Basically, you get to use an enemy as if they were part of your own squadron, abilities and all, for three turns. Remember all those times a thin man spat poison at you or a floater descended from the heavens right behind your team? Now you can return the favor and do it right back to the AI. Pretty cool to see things from the alien's perspective if I'm being honest. The less cool part is that it only lasts for three turns and you can't intentionally damage your alien puppet until they become an enemy again. At least not with your psionic powers anyway. You can, however, throw them directly into the line of fire in hopes that the AI will take care of them for you. Well, Shorty, we had a good run. But let's remember all the good times rather than- Ow! The hell, Shorty! And after everything I did for you! Honestly, you'd think I'd forced him to kill his friends or something. Anyway, more successful missions, more psionic and class-based promotions, more Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. You know the drill. So, while my units cause general havoc with the alien forces and keep getting promotions as quickly as they can, let's talk about why we chose the support and assault classes. Essentially, none of the classes are truly built to be a psionic powerhouse. It's just not the way the game intends for you to play. However, these two classes have several abilities that still benefit the way we're playing. First, let's talk about the three assaults in my squad. They'll all have the same build, so without further ado, here's the only skills we'll be aiming for. Tactical Sense, which gives plus five defense for every enemy in sight. Lightning Reflexes, which makes it so that the first reaction shots against my soldier always miss. Extra Conditioning, which gives more HP depending on how heavy the soldier's armor is. And Resilience, which makes any soldier immune to critical hits. Not exactly a large number of skills, but the ones that are there are certainly important. My support class gets just about as many abilities, but has a much more important role for the team. Smoke grenades give 20 defense to anyone inside them, which is always a plus. And Sprinter lets my support class move three more tiles than normal. Smoke and Mirrors gives me two additional smoke grenades, and the piece de resistance, combat drugs, which makes my smoke grenades give not only defense, but a plus 20 will bonus as well. Needless to say, I'm sure you see why having a support was so important to me. One support is enough to boost the entire team's willpower by 20 and provide defensive bonuses three times per battle. A buff that could make or break the run if used at the right time. Because the larger the discrepancy, the higher the- But with my soldiers blowing through missions at a rapid rate, we can now get rapid recovery, which is always helpful, and lead by example, which gives all nearby soldiers the same will as the squad leader. For those of you wondering, the squad leader is whichever soldier you put here. What, it wasn't obvious by the way they're imperceptibly a little closer to the camera than the rest of your soldiers? Well, aren't we feeling cheeky today? I guess you just want your hand held through every mechanic, don't you? So with all that sorted, I decided to finally get my squad into the gene lab and gave as many of them as I could adaptive bone marrow. And between that and rapid recovery, we shouldn't have any problems keeping our squad on the field. I swear, it's like XCOM just knows. I can't think of a single run where the terrorism event triggered at a convenient time. So. Let's talk about one of the messiest and most complicated battles of the run. As anyone who's played XCOM knows, we're about to run into my favorite enemy in the game, Chrysalids. And yes, that was sarcasm. While there are certainly other enemies running around the map, they're a little more than speed bumps at this point. 
Nothing we haven't seen before. But, fun fact about chrysalids, they have an insane amount of will. No idea why. Probably because they have a hive mind mentality or something. But yeah, mind fraying a chrysalid is essentially a 0% chance. And mind control? Forget about it. And do you know why? Because the larger the discrepancy, the higher your chance to hit. See? Told you there was a reason to recoil in horror. However, we can get my new alien party members to take care of the problem for me. And floaters are the perfect weapon. They do plenty of damage, have decent accuracy, and can fly above the chrysalids heads and out of range if they ever get too close. If only we could keep control of them for more than three turns. It got a little ugly for a second there, but with some careful timing and strategic running away, I'm able to recapture my floater squadron, then finish off the last of the chrysalids with minimal casualties. After that, it's a matter of cleaning up any remaining zombies scooting their way around the map, then murdering my darlings. And while I made it sound relatively clean just now, remember, this run took five separate attempts to get it right. So many runs decimated because of not enough experience or willpower. So many Power Rangers left dead on the pavement. Or worse. And this was just the first brick wall. You don't even know. I hand out a few medals to my soldiers and give the Medal of Honor to my squad leader. This medal grants an extra one will for every mission my soldiers complete without casualties. Combine this with lead by example, and we've just given our entire squad a plus 10 bonus by the end of the run. Moving right along, it's time we introduce the second brick wall. Y'all remember the Matrix? Remember how Neo was able to blow up machines with his mind by the end of the series? Well, forget that shit, because it doesn't work here. Turns out, mind powers don't work on things that don't have a mind. And this doesn't just go for the squiddies. This goes for every machine in the game. Thankfully, I've put enough hours into the multiple attempts of this run to know how to time my mind controls. And even a sectoid can kill a squiddy with Overwatch if they're kept close enough. But here's the thing. If you don't have an alien that you can mind control, there's literally nothing you can do to take out a squiddy. Which means your only option is to just sit back and watch as it slowly strangles your entire team. But with the mission cleared, we'll have access to the squiddy autopsies. Which means we can at least start making respirator implants, which protect my soldiers from strangulation. And not a moment too soon, because squiddies are becoming a regular occurrence. At least with respirator implants, I have a better chance of retreating out of a mission if there's no way to kill them. And yes, before you ask, one of my runs ended this exact way. For whatever reason, the game thought it would be fun to introduce them into missions before I even had the terror event. Which meant by the time the terror event rolled around, my team was wildly inexperienced and, therefore, dead on arrival. But with that all taken care of, it turns out experience is the greatest teacher. We're actually doing really well, and the scores show as much. I immediately spend my newfound cash on tactical rigging, so that my soldiers can use their nanofiber armor and respirators at the same time, and thank god I did. Turns out the game has decided it's had enough of my shit, and is throwing everything it can at me now. Thankfully, mutons are very weak-willed, and make wonderful mind control targets. They have amazing damage, decent accuracy, and even come with an alien grenade, a fact that we'll absolutely be taking advantage of. Oh look, an opportunity! Now, chrysalids aren't quite the threat they were at the beginning of the run, and can be taken down with enough luck, but it takes Psy Inspiration to even get above a 50% chance to hit, so it's still not ideal. Thankfully, my support class finally unlocked combat drugs, so that's another way to boost my squad's willpower. And my assault class soldiers aren't too far behind either. Getting better all the time. But after all of that, I finally put in the time to build an alien containment area, which means we can start to actually progress the storyline. What the? Oh, right. Exalt. Kinda forgot about them. Well, that's another plate I didn't need to balance. Go get them, loco. Give them hell. In the meantime, I capture myself a muton, because why not? Then find a questionable solution for getting rid of the remainder of my darlings. Look, they were gonna die no matter what. It's better this way. For, for me, I mean. Uh, but hey, don't think about that. Instead, let's all marvel at the particle effects of combat drugs. Oh, and I also captured the alien ship captain. Because why whole-ass one thing when you can half-ass multiple things at the same time? I finish earning the European continent bonus, then send in my Power Rangers to go mess with Exalt while we wait on Valen to, uh, question the aliens I've caught so far. Gentlemen, hope you're well. Got a question for you. Never wonder if you're on the winning side? Unfortunately, Exalt forces are essentially just really bad rookie soldiers at this point, so mind controlling them is more for convenience than practical use. I won't lie to you though, it is pretty satisfying making them blow themselves up. Vicarious catharsis at its finest. But with my new pet aliens properly interrogated, we now have access to the Outsider Shard which in turn means I have access to the alien base key. Time to get to work. I equip as many of my units as possible with Titan armor, then get to work infiltrating the alien base. 
And if I'm being honest, there's not a whole lot here that I haven't dealt with before. Thin men, floaters, a couple chrysalids, and... Oh, hello there. What are you doing so far from home? Here, let me help you get back to where you belong. There we are. Now we can keep go- Oh, come on! Oh, come on! This mission took a few tries, but eventually I landed on a proper strategy. Grab two floaters with mind control, then push slowly through the entire base. I hunker down whenever I'm about to lose control, let the floaters come back to me like the good boys that they are, then use my other two soldiers to reset the mind control and get back to clearing. Rinse and repeat until the rooms are clear, then reward the floaters for a job well done. Alright, time for the final room. How hard can it be? Huh. I may have killed my floaters a little early. Well, nothing a little combat drugs can't fix. Have at ye! Shit. My boy! Look what they're doing to my boy! Oh, thank god the cavalry is here. Let's just get you out of there, and get a little help from the other team. What the? 40% chance to mind control? Hell yeah, take the shot. Oh, wow, we actually got it. Nice, dude. Just think of all the damage I can do with the chrysalid. They're not gonna know what hit him, and it's dead. Cool. Well, one good turn deserves another. In any case, all that's left is the sectoid commander. And the way I see it, we might as well capture the little dude. Let me just get rid of our muton problem real quick. There we are. And now we can focus on catching a new Pokemon for our collection. Go, Pokeball! And there we are. Congratulations, Officer Sweaterweather. You won the war. Well, almost. Unfortunately, we've got a bit more to do before the end. First and foremost, we need to study the Hyperwave Relay. Oh, and a few more Titan Armors wouldn't hurt either. And after a few uneventful weeks, where we research every story important plotline we can, we find out why the aliens have been so quiet. Guess they've been developing cyber disks. They're not terrible if you've got a few stronger aliens on your side, but if we ever find ourselves without, it's going to be a really bad time. Thankfully, after finishing the Sectoid Commander autopsy, we have a new toy for our soldiers, the Neural Feedback Gene Mod. Essentially, anytime a psychic alien tries to do anything to one of my soldiers, they'll take damage and trigger all their Psy Attack cooldowns. Definitely a must have. Now we just need to, oh. Oh, that's not good. Well, it's that time again. Time for the biggest brick wall of the entire run, the XCOM base defense. Considering this is the last run for XCOM 1, what do you think? Do we have time for one last meme? I, I, I don't know what you mean. Answer me! Oh, please, God. So, let's talk strategy. First things first, we need to get our most important assets off the ground level and up into the balconies. Then we need to see what we're dealing with. Mostly sectoids and sectoid commanders, but we do have a mectoid and a chrysalid problem as well. Not ideal. Is what I would say if it didn't turn out that mectoids have one of the weakest wills in the game, apparently. Well, never look a gift horse in the mouth. Couldn't tell you what the logic is on that one, but hey, at least now we get to play around with some heavy firepower. I use Mind Fray to eliminate any organic life I can, then immediately realized that the gift horse I was given was in fact a lemon all along. How the hell did you miss? It's three feet from you! Ah well, at least we have tanks now. Terrible, awful tanks that don't do anything except miss twice in one turn. Meanwhile, the next waves have started to arrive. More chrysalids and thin men. Nothing too awful. At least, nothing a little science inspiration can fix. 71% chance. I'll take those odds. But while my squad is busy cleaning up the front, more aliens are arriving at the back. Mostly machines as well. I reset mind controls on the mectoids in preparation, then watch in horror as they fail to perform the simplest of tasks. Seriously, you had one job. How did you even- Well, it's one mectoid against two cyber disks at this point. My squad has nothing they can help with, and every other soldier XCOM has seen fit to give me is actually ungifted. I'm not sure why, but for all intents and purposes, they're just meat shields that can be used as distractions. Eh, such as it is. But just as all hope seemed lost, my prayers were answered. The clouds parted, and a battalion of mutons descended from the heavens, surrounded in a heavenly glow. A beautiful, purple, ethereal glow. While I left the mutants to deal with the robotic menace barreling down from the back rooms, I retreated my squadron further into the base, leaving the meat shields scattered about to act as a secondary distraction, just in case. Thankfully, it was just more chrysalids in the front rooms, so my squadron was more than capable, and my mutants were proving highly effective against the cyber disks as well. And even though the aliens sent in another wave of sectoid commanders and mectoids, things were actually looking up. A quick psionic pep rally, and a reset of mind control later, and the mission was looking pretty solidly beaten. And to think, I was worried. I mean, yeah, the Sectoid Commanders did steal most of my meat shields and turn them against me, and I did lose one of my mutons, and that muton did turn around and murder the last of my meat shields, and I did 
did get pushed into a corner with only four squad mates remaining. But, uh, wh where was I going with this? All right, screw it. Sorry, Sergeant Pepper, but an enemy is an enemy is an enemy. Thank you for your service. By some miracle, the last remaining mechtoid was actually able to kill the last cyberdisc, which means it's down to two sectoid commanders and the mechtoid itself. I bring my squad down from hiding, then proceed to mind fray the commander who attached itself to the mechtoid. Nothing a little science inspiration and superior willpower can't fix. One more commander to go. Now we just need to find him. Ah, damn it, it looks like he found us first. Mind control? Oh, that's not what we need right now. Oh. Oh, hey. Oh, I completely forgot about the neural feedback mod. Uh, well, I guess that's that. Flawless victory. Don't, uh, just don't look at that. But with that brick wall complete, I can only think of one more challenge that might get in our way. Time for the final push. A few of my soldiers are promoted to their maximum rank, which means maximum will gains have been achieved, and the Star of Terra medal is also unlocked, which gives my entire squad a plus five bonus to will and defense. You'd love to see it. I finish researching the Firestorm and make sure to order one as soon as possible, then unlock Ghost Armor for my squad, which will undoubtedly help when I'm trying to look ahead to see if there's mechanical enemies lurking around. Ah. Oh yeah, Exalt, completely forgot about you. Honestly, there's nothing to say about them. I make a point of always grabbing any of their heavy soldiers, then use their explosives on the rest of the squad, usually to devastating results. You know, I hadn't realized how hard and fast I was pushing through the storyline until just now. I'm running around with Titan armor and pushing for the last two missions in the game, and here's Exalt trying to fight me off with base level weapons and armor. What do you say, bud? Give it a rest? All right, good talk. I unlock Drone Capture, which probably won't be super useful, but at least gives me another option for dealing with machine enemies. Then decide it's time to go big or go home, and push toward the end. Oh, you would. Nope, sorry, don't have time. Exalt, we talked about this. Ooh, got time for that though. Nope, no time. No time, man. And for the low, low cost of two countries leaving XCOM, we've done it. The Firestorm is ready for action, and we can push forward in the storyline once more. I mean, I've seen worse report cards. They'll thank me before the end. Probably. I finally get the hyperwave relay working after applying a liberal amount of duct tape and wishful thinking, send my firestorm after the overseer UFO equipped with an EMP cannon, blast it down with minimal effort, then send in the squad. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go get us a purple ball. Oh God, I've made a mistake. Nope, not worth it. Get out of there, Skinner. Thankfully, the overseer UFO also has some elite mutons. Feels kind of weird to be thankful for that, but that's just the way this run plays out. They're harder to mind control than regular mutons, but not by much. I use my new toys to get rid of the Psychopod's drones, since they'll just heal it if we don't. Exhibit A. And with that speed bump handled, I have to make a decision. Things aren't exactly looking winnable at the moment. What with the Psychopod at full health and my mutons barely able to make a dent. So we have two choices. We can do our best to stick it out and pray to RN Jesus that our muton can kill the Sectopod before he's annihilated, or we can use him as a meat shield while we dive further into the map in search of another solution. Well, guess that answers that. I push my way into the ship, give my team a psionic pep talk, then prepare to enter the center room. Going ghost. Let's see what we've got. All right, two elite mutons and an ethereal. I can work with that. With science inspiration and a little combat drug boost, the first order of business is to injure the ethereal. And since damage reduces an enemy's will, we now have just enough of a shot to mind control him. Fuck yeah, boys, that's what I'm talking about. All right, we've only got three turns of control. Time to make them count. I grab myself a muton, make myself an easier exit for my new ethereal, remove any potential threats between me and my final target, then give said target something to chase. And it's taken the bait. Well, everyone, I think it's time to show off the final psionic ability. One that you can't use until the final mission, unless you have an ethereal under mind control. Behold, the Rift. A psionic storm that damages every unit inside it for two turns. How much damage does it do? Well, that depends entirely on your will. The larger the discrepancy between the caster and the target, the larger the damage. And robots, despite being unable to be mind controlled, are treated as having zero will in this equation. Which means massive damage and one dead sectopod. Three turns wisely used. And despite the ethereal turning on me and stealing one of my soldiers from me, the neural feedback does its thing, and a little follow-up finishes the job. Huh, didn't realize they exploded. Guess that saves me a step. A random elite floater later, and there we go. Mission complete. Which means we now have the alien plasma ball. I love the way touching it raises your hair. 
you don't have any hair. Anyway, I get to work building a gallop chamber, develop Psy Armor, which gives any soldier wearing it 20 extra will, sell literally everything I have on the gray market in order to afford four of them, then get my squad suited up and ready for the final fight. And with that, we're as ready as we'll ever be. It's time to end this. Cue the montage. Here we go, the mothership. Smoke them if you got them. The first room is all sectoids, simple enough. Just use Psy Inspiration to boost the squad, take control of the sectoid commander and a few of his subordinates, then start mind blasting. And while the sectoid commander's greatest strengths aren't usable while under mind control, yeah, at least he's got good aim and an alien grenade. So that's something. Up next is two cyber disks and their drones. Again, simple enough. Just use the sectoids to plink down one of the groups, and use our newfound ability to unleash the void on the other. That's right, the psionic soldier who uses the gallop chamber can now use Rift every five turns, which means we no longer need to live in fear of machines. So long as we pace ourselves, anyway. But one self-destructed sectoid commander later, and the last of our pets finally takes down the remaining cyber disc. Well done, little one. Enjoy your prize. A swift death. Up next is the floater room. It's more of the same. Just convert a majority of the enemies to the Firebomb Academy, remove any opposition, then use our new converts to decimate the chrysalids who spawn in on the next turn. Right then, moving on. The next room has three thin men, which aren't even worth mentioning, but the next room has a boatload of mutons. And how we handle this room is actually critical. I convert one muton to my cause, which in turn lures the muton berserker that's hiding in the back. And after a little bit of tenderizing and a little more conversion, I nab myself a berserker. Time to put him to work. He's a bit of a one-trick pony. He can either stab things, or break through walls and stab things. But luckily for us, that's really all we need him to do. Ignoring the remaining mutons hiding in the back of the room, I send the berserker into the next area, triggering what will likely be the second hardest area of the mothership, the sectopod room. Using my three unwilling participants, I do my best to soften up the sectopods. It's not very effective, but free damage is free damage. And when you're facing off against not one, but two of the tankiest enemies in the game, every little bit helps. I use the last of the mutants to my advantage, which is to say that I effectively throw each and every one of them into a meat grinder. And with my mutants more or less used up, it's time for the final push. I give the sectopods something to chase, then get into just the right position to send off a rift, dealing 10 damage each turn. Thankfully, sectopods are too stubborn to move when they've got an easy target in front of them, and after Lady Luck decides to finally show her face and let my bait live to fight another room, the Psychopods go down. Flawless catharsis. May I never see the likes of you again. The two remaining Mutown elites in the room might as well be non-existent. So without further ado, it's time for the last arena of the entire game. No need for strategy on this one. Time for brute force. As expected, the two Mutown elites in the room take out my own. But that's just one less thing for me to worry about. Besides, why worry about what can so easily be replaced? The Ethereals do their best to fight back, but every attack they make against me causes them to take damage, regardless of whether they hit me or not. And every time they injure themselves trying to attack me, they make themselves easier and easier to hit. Poor bastards were already dead. They just didn't know it yet. Well, XCOM, this is the end. You've nowhere left to run. It's time to put you down. For good this time. Thanks for all the good times, and the bad. And with one last roll of the dice, it's over. XCOM, Enemy Within, beaten with only psionic powers. This was easily the most unique run I've done in this game, and also one of the hardest. But I suppose it's only fitting that a run consisting of only brain power required the most brain power to complete. Goodbye, XCOM. May the stars shine forever on your face. And that's it. There's nothing left to do here. Time to move on to XCOM 2. But before we go, as promised, I'd like to impart a little knowledge on anyone interested in doing their own XCOM runs, challenge or not. If that's not you, thanks for watching the video through to the end. Take care of yourself, be good to one another, and I'll see you again soon. But for those that remain, stay a while and listen. As we all know, XCOM is slow. There's so much dead time, and playthroughs are long enough as it is. So, as thanks for the good times, 
here's how I've been speeding things up and making my own challenge runs. First things first, we need to find our XCOM folder. It'll be wherever your Steam folders are. For me, it's Program Files x86, Steam, Steam Apps, Common, then XCOM. These codes work for both Enemy Unknown and Enemy Within. If you're playing Enemy Unknown, we'll just click on XCOM Game here. But if you're playing Enemy Within, click on XEW and then XCOM Game. After that, we go into Config, and finally, Default Input. Now the fun part. This entire document has all the key bindings and what they do for XCOM. And we're not going to touch any of it. Rather, we're going to scroll all the way to the bottom, then add the following code. It's a bunch of gobbledygook, so I won't try to say it out loud. But you can either copy it from the screen, or I've put it in the description as well, so you can copy and paste it into your game files. This one here lets you change the game speed on combat maps, and this one here lets you change the game speed whenever you're back at home base. Simply hold Alt, then press the appropriate key for whichever speed you want. F7 for normal speed, F8 for 1.5 times, and F9 for double time. If this isn't fast enough for you, though trust me when I say it should be, you can always change the numbers here to make them whatever you want. So if you want an automatic slow-mo button, this would be the way to do it. And that's that. Simple enough, right? Well, good news. If you dive a little deeper, you can actually make a button press for any code available via the dev console. You can spawn enemies, weapons, unlock every ability from the start of the game so you can try out some builds, or give your character psionic powers like I did. All you need to do is take the code I gave you earlier and add a few tweaks. For example, to make a soldier gifted, all you have to do is decide on the binding, I made mine Alt F1, then change the command. In this case, it would be Give Psy Gift. Please note that in order for this command to work, you can either use it during combat, which will then give your soldier the gift when they return to base, or you can set it up to work at HQ. If you go the HQ route, just know that you have to use it while in the soldier's loadout. Not exactly sure why it's like that, but if you do it that way and then back out, you'll know right away if it worked. So yeah, that's about it. I hope this improves your XCOM runs, or breathes new life into a game that's over a decade old. Thanks again for watching through to the end, as well as all the love and support you've given to me throughout the years. Now if you'll excuse me, it's time for bigger and allegedly better things. Take care of yourselves, be good to one another, and I'll see you again soon.